Okay, great. Um, so I'm Paul Warwick, and my external partner is currently in Adelaide in Australia. So we're going to, to hopefully, hopefully, rely upon a couple of video links to work just for us to draw from Andrew's perspective on all this. Otherwise, there'll be time for me to tell you a couple of jokes. But I'm sure, I'm sure it will work. Okay. Just to very quickly, uh, the context. I, um, it's already been mentioned a couple of times this morning, I work for the Centre for Sustainable Futures. So as part of the university's uh, agenda about being a, a world-leading sustainable university, as well as the research centre and the, the Institute ISSR, what we also have is a centre for sustainable futures which purely focuses upon education and how we can be engaging students in sustainability education in vibrant, engaging and apt ways. Um, and so my role, one of my roles is to conduct educational research. A key area of sustainability education that is currently being um, well, is continue to be supported by the United Nations internationally, is how we incorporate the global dimension. And just to give you a, a very quick sort of anecdotal story, I've just been doing some work with, with a school, a primary school, that is literally just four miles north of this campus. So right on the edge of, of, of Plymouth City Centre. And I was doing some work with, with uh, teachers there around how they could incorporate the global dimension into their teaching. And they were, they were saying that um, a significant proportion of their children that arrive at the school have never been to the coast. So their, their world is literally the neighbourhood of the, the estate that they, they are brought up in. And, and they were rightly saying, how, how do we bring the global dimension into the lives of these children that have got that narrower sense of place? And so the project that uh, Andrew and I have been involved with has been looking at how we can incorporate the global dimension into education. And it's led to a book that's been published by Routledge. And, um, and what I'll do is I'll now see if we can get the first link to work for Andrew to give you a brief explanation a bit more about our book. Thanks, Paul. The book's organised around key concepts, and these really provide the framework for the wider and deeper ideas that we engage with in its contents. Now, from the start, we had to grapple, even in the title, which we changed from the original proposal, with the terminology. And that's reflected in the first chapter on globalisation, global citizenship, and global education. So in that chapter, we really grapple with the contested notions, not only of different approaches within global learning, and education, but also really on how the whole field is conceptualised. So, for example, the extent to which global education uh, is the same as or is just one aspect of global learning. So the themes we uh, selected and that form the structure of the book are interconnectedness and interdependency, cultural diversity, social justice, which includes human rights education and development education, sustainable development, and in the conclusion we wanted to say something about educating for and about the future. Now, throughout the text, there are a number of principles or ideas that we really wanted to emphasise. And I think really we have the structure and the organising principles, but it's these principles and ideas that are the key to what we were trying to achieve. So Paul will speak in a minute uh, about hope and about the notion of critical creatives. But really we wanted to develop a sense that at the heart of global learning and education must be notions of compassion, reciprocity, recognition and solidarity. Now there's not time to go into each of these areas in details here, but we would strongly argue that these are the underpinning foundations of approaches to global learning, particularly approaches to global learning that are based on partnership. So in the book, we try to tease these out, sometimes implicitly and at others explicitly. So while the key concepts that provide the structure for the book um, are important, really it's these principles related to partnership that relate more centrally, centrally to the overall aims that we have for the book. Back over to you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. That took a whole lot of doing. <laughs> Okay, so, so the, 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 the research project we, we embarked upon was as much about practice as it was about theory. And one of the things that, um, that came out as we looked internationally about how global dimension can be incorporated into the education of our children, but also of our university students, was um, 
the problem of them getting completely swamped by the scale and complexity of the global challenges. And this is a quote that, of course, I've, I've picked out because it's an extreme version. But it's certainly not a unique response to students that have gone through a certain type of global learning where they've just been exposed to the variety of global challenges and points of crisis that we are currently facing. And so I think one of the key things that we found from our research project is the importance of us including in our work narratives of hope and engaging our students in active citizenship and, and trusting them to be able to be critical creatives. And one of the projects I wanted to just draw attention to is, is something by um, Ian Cook at Exeter University uh, called Follow the Things, which is a fantastic uh, website that I really encourage you to, to check out. It, it kind of looks like an online um, uh, shopping site, but what it's about is students researching the journey of everyday things, commodities and products, and learning through the process of researching those items their global interconnectedness and, and engaging in issues of injustice, inequality and, and the need for more sustainable ways of us uh, consuming. So that's one example from here. This, within the university here, we've got lots of examples of, of fantastic practice in this area. And again, I don't know whether Ricky Lowe's is here, but from the uh, Plymouth Business School, Ricky pioneered something called the, the Global Challenge Programme that's about trying to engage students in a way that's hopeful, that trusts them to be critical creatives, and engages them in, in how they can make a difference. But uh, again, let's just draw from Andrew and some examples that he's got from, from the other side of the pond. We wanted to provide a further illustration of the sense of partnership that's portrayed and encouraged in the book. And so in chapter four, which focuses on social justice, we set out a case study that we developed in partnership with the Australian Foundation for Fostering Learning in the Philippines. Now, this is a small voluntary NGO based in Adelaide that works to contribute to the educational development of young people in some of the poorest areas of the Philippines. And in constructing the case study, we had to think very carefully about which organisation to work with and the reasons for doing so. And ultimately, we decided that there were certain benefits to providing a study, a case study of a small NGO uh, rather than a larger national or multinational organisation that perhaps is more recognisable. So the title of the case study is Developing Sustainable Partnerships in the Philippines. And in it, the educational aims and projects of the foundation are set out. And the purpose of the case study really is to try and tease out some of the elements of partnerships that are at the heart of the foundation's work. Now, to do this, it starts by really setting out the types of partnerships that the foundation is involved in. Of course, there's the partnerships with the schools uh, in the Philippines themselves and local stakeholders, but also uh, the partnerships that the foundation has developed between schools within the Philippines, as well as between schools in the Philippines and schools in Australia. So within the case study, uh, particular aspects of building an enduring partnership are brought out. Now these include the ideas and principles of shared agency, reciprocity and uh, mutuality and, and I think really that's at the heart of what we were trying to achieve. So to bring a critical creative perspective um, to thinking about partnerships and particularly in terms of things such as school linking but to do so in a way which recognises not only the importance of partnership but really what that partnership can mean in terms of ideas like agency, reciprocity, mutuality and, and really working together uh, on a common purpose and for shared learning. Okay, thanks Paul. Back over to you. Okay, so just to wrap up um, from, from the research project, we were able to identify a set of core principles that we felt uh, good practice, both in this country and, and internationally, was following in terms of how to effectively engage students with, global, with the global dimension. Um, and again, I, I won't expand upon those now, um, but that might be something that we could follow up uh, over lunch. But having done this sort of work, I just wanted to... Um, to show you that when we try and follow these principles, we, we are amazed at what the students come up with. So top right is, is a session uh, a group of students helped me to run with, with local primary school using this huge interactive map. And we were amazed at the, the enthusiasm and the curiosity of these children about their wider world. 
the bottom right is an example of, of, of a group of students that have, have engaged with the global dimension and then thought, right, what are we going to do practically? And then the two slides on the, on the left-hand side are, are the challenges that some of the students give us when they say, if you are a sustainable university, then this is the sort of campus we were imagining. They also come up with some really wacky stuff. I'm still not sure this is real, but they assured me it was, and it's, it's, it's a bus in Spain. Um, but I just wanted to end on this, and that is that I, on the, on the back of this work, I was um, having a conversation with an eight-year-old lad uh, just last week, and, um, and he'd been, he'd been in looking at this whole global learning thing, and, uh, and this lad said, global learning isn't really about changing the world, because as children, we can't change the world. We, we don't have people listening to us about our ideas. So it's not about changing the world, it's about changing ourselves. And I thought that was quite profound, that he'd, he'd got that from the, from the Global Dimension work that the school had been doing. And I think that I just wanted to end on that thought, really, that you know, this conference, we're hearing about lots of different things, and we're hearing about exposure to issues around the world. But, but a key part of the sustainability agenda is us thinking again about how we can change ourselves, and how we can do that in ways that are more compassionate and more caring. So I hope from the end of today, you've each got something that makes you think about how you're changing, as well as thinking about how we can change the world. Thank you very much.